the Your Safe Space podcast is recorded on Wurundjeri land. This podcast acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Your Safe Space, the podcast. I'm your host, Adele Marie, and this podcast is here for you. It is a safe space for us to catch up each week to discuss anything and everything. And on today's show, we have an AMA on air and Ask Me Anything. And I love these episodes so much. The Friday ones are actually my favorite because they are usually shorter. They're a bit juicier. I get to cover a lot more things. And it also means it's the end of the week. And can I just say, what a week it has been. <laughs> I am very happy to see the back end of this month. I'm very happy to see the back end of this week and I'm so grateful it's the weekend. If you have had a rough week, just know that it's over. We're at the weekend and hopefully it gets a little bit better for you too. And if you haven't, it's a nice little reminder to do that mid-year check-in so you can go back and listen to that episode or come into the Facebook group so that you can grab those journal prompts and yeah, head into the next six months of the year with a little bit of clarity and starting refreshed if that's what you feel like you need. Now, we're going to get into the show, but before we do, this episode is not a replacement for professional mental health help or support. If you do need that, please check the show notes. Question number one, how do I ask for a pay rise and negotiate my salary? And I absolutely love when career questions come through. I feel like this could have been triggered by last week's episode about the leadership and like stepping into a new Uh, chapter or like a new position. I also love this topic because it's not something that we are ever taught and I feel like it can be something that we are really scared to do and it's not something that a lot of us would naturally do or know how to do and so I know it doesn't necessarily apply to every field or industry. I know in some different areas depending on what you do for work and how your pay structure works you might not be able to ask for pay rises and negotiate your salary but I love doing this in my previous positions because it did apply. I worked in the private sector. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. And I learned about asking for either promotions or pay rises because of a mentor I had at the time. And he just taught me to always ask for what I was worth and to always ask the question, because what's the worst that's going to happen? You get a no or a not right now, or you learn and you figure out where you need to be come however many months down the track. I also believe that negotiating a salary increase or asking for a promotion includes a few different things and we're going to go through that. I think the timing matters. I think the preparation matters and I think your personal career goals also matter too. Some key times when I've asked for a promotion in the past, obviously I work for myself now, but I did work the corporate private sector industry for a long time, all of my 20s. And I always asked whenever I took a new role or whenever I moved positions, whether that was like internally or to a new company. And I also would ask if I had ever taken on extra responsibility or extra tasks or duties. And then I would also ask around mid-year review or end of year, depending on like how I had media check-ins with my manager at the time. Some other times that you could ask are if you feel like you've exceeded your current role, so you're eager for more responsibility and you're ready to step up. Another time could be that you have demonstrated an increase in revenue for the business, or maybe you have just increased some value for the business. So I'm talking about things like maybe you came up with a better way to do a process. Maybe you streamlined something. Maybe you had a really cool idea for something and you introduced like a whole new offering or something like that. You could also ask if your responsibilities have increased, if you have come around to your employment anniversary. That seemed like a pretty popular one. You could ask at the end of financial year or end of calendar year. You could ask before the next budget sign off, or you could ask when your boss is in a good mood. (laughs) Now, these are my top tips and what would help me whenever I did ask. And so the first thing is always to have a very clear why. And this looks like assessing where you're at and looking at how your progress is currently going. Are you succeeding in your current tasks? Are you completing all of your work? Do you need to step up into a different role? Are you ready to feel more challenged? Have you increased value for the business? Have you increased revenue? Maybe you have also already had extra responsibility put on you. (laughs) I know that's really common for some industries where maybe people have left and instead of hiring someone, they just give that responsibility to the rest of the staff that are still there. Maybe that could be a time for you to step up or ask for a pay rise too. And maybe you just are feeling ready and like you want to step up or you're wanting to earn more and 
that's a good enough reason too. If you have a solid why, it can really help you frame up the conversation. The next thing I would do is to try and do some research on similar roles in similar industries, either internal to your business if you can. I know pay transparency is not really a thing. They don't, usually employers don't like staff talking about pay (laughs) with each other, which I think is bullshit, but see if you can jump online, maybe even on Seek, have a look at what other roles similar to yours are being paid and see where that benchmark is and see where you're sitting and then ask for a little bit extra. (laughs) The next tip is to prepare. Now, some of us may not need to do this to the extreme, I did. And what I mean by that is maybe it's creating a presentation. Maybe it's creating a spreadsheet. Maybe it is outlining all of your accomplishments, all of the amazing things you've done and really articulating clearly why you believe you deserve that pay rise. Perhaps you may have just done some upskilling. Maybe you went and did a course or maybe you have done some, I don't know, mentoring or shadowing of somebody else in the business. How can you quantify that on paper and get prepared to actually having that face-to-face conversation. It is so important that you know what you want before you have the conversation, because if you don't know what you want, it can make the conversation really hard, and then it doesn't give you a chance to actually negotiate as well. The other thing I actually recommend doing before you have a chat is looking at some letter templates. You can just go on like Etsy or even Google, and you can have a look and even practice writing one out just so it can get you like familiar and comfortable with asking, because I know it's not something that comes naturally to a lot of us, but if you do that, that can kind of soften that nervy feeling as well. And then the last part is communicating. (laughs) And I'm going to argue that this is probably the hardest part as well, because it can be uncomfortable to ask for what you want. But as I said at the start, if you don't ask, you're never going to know. And it's better to ask than wonder what if forever. Okay. Now, depending on your relationship with your boss is obviously going to depend on how you have that conversation. You might have a very informal dynamic. You might be able to sit down and just have like a 10 minute chat with them. Maybe things are a little bit more formal at your workplace. So you might actually need to book in a 10 or 15 minute meeting to bring it up. And I think what I would recommend is when you're having that conversation, keep it very clear, keep it very focused, have your facts there to back you up and say, this is what I'm seeking because of X, Y, Z and go from there and really make sure that the statements you're making are very like strong I statements. Things like, I am committed to this business. I have shown my value doing X, Y, Z or my results from X, Y, Z demonstrate how invested I am. I see future growth here. I would like to be rewarded for my efforts. Using that kind of language will help you too. Give your top few examples, obviously, to help explain your why. And remember that it's a two-way conversation. Okay, so your boss may ask you questions back. They may start negotiating with you. They may also say no. And I want to tell you, don't panic if they don't come back to you right away or if they do say no. If they do want to come back to you and you do have to negotiate, that's a good position to be in because then you can compromise and hopefully work towards or work together to get towards that, you know, number or salary amount that you're happy with. And if they say no, that is a really good chance to ask for feedback on why so that you can sit down and think, hey, am I actually happy to accept this right now? Or maybe my boss wants more from me and I need to step up in these following areas to be able to get that in maybe three or six months. If they do say no, I really recommend booking in or even saying to them that you you want to book in another conversation in three or six months so that you can revisit it. And then lastly, if your employer doesn't budge (laughs) at all and they say no and they don't want to move on it and they never want to discuss it again or they're being really difficult to deal with, it may be time to consider your other options. I'm not going to sit here and say quit your job because I think if you can have a good conversation and get rewarded for your efforts, that's always a better outcome if you are really happy where you're at. But don't be afraid to also leave if it's not serving you too. Good luck. I would love for you to come into the group. Tell us how you went. If you have any other tips and you guys have done this and there's something that I haven't covered, please share your tips and tricks in the group as well. Question number two, what is your advice on getting back into the dating world and letting down that wall after a bad breakup? And I just want to give this listener a big hug and send all my love to you because I definitely get it. Being hurt absolutely sucks. I think recovering from a breakup is a very harsh thing to do, a very difficult thing to navigate. I also wish I had more context because I don't know how long you are out of your breakup, but I do want to give you some hope and remind you that 
it's okay. You will definitely get back out there in the dating world. It is possible to let your wall down and it is possible to find love and be happy again. I would love for you to take a moment though before you do get back out there to just acknowledge why that wall is there in the first place. Sometimes we aren't ready to get back out into the world because we are, well, the dating world, because we are still really hurt. And a lot of the time that wall is there to like protect our little hearts and make sure that we don't get hurt again. And so I don't know what happened in your last breakup, but I would love for you to have a look and see if there's any more work you need to do to either address and release that pain so that you can move forward when you are feeling more ready. Sometimes we also just need to give ourselves time. (laughs) And I know that some of you guys may have followed me in my heartbreak era, but it was a combination of time that helped me and active healing as well. So really taking that active or proactive approach to getting over it. I also think just taking stock of where you are and using some self-awareness is the first best step. So if you don't feel ready, you don't have to get back out there. Okay. There's no rush. The dating pool's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's still going to be there when you are ready. If you also need to take some time out to work on your own self-love and self-confidence and self-value, you can do that too. And obviously you guys would know right now I have gone through the end of that dating situation, situationship that I was in. And even though it's not a breakup, I definitely did get hurt, but right now I can see that my wall is straight back up again. And I just need to give myself time to process that before I let it down again. I also want to say this because what happens is when you are in a better place and when you feel ready and when you are open to finding somebody, you'll actually be able to see it. If you go out into the dating world too soon and you're not ready or you're still feeling hurt or resentful or anger or having emotions that you haven't processed yet, that might put you at risk of attracting or choosing the wrong dynamic or unhealthy situations and putting yourself in unhealthy moments or situations with people that don't serve you. And that's because when we're in a good place, when we feel ready, when we are better equipped to see and attract and choose a better partner, it is so much better to be in tune with yourself and your emotions so that you can make choices in alignment that serve your values, that serve you. And that really just helps you navigate that dating world with a better mindset. Obviously, in saying that, if you feel ready and you want to put yourself back out there, I'm going to give you some tips. My top tip really is just having your own back. And if you are feeling super ready, just know that whatever you've been through in the past has taught you a lesson. You've taken whatever it is from the previous relationship. You should also have a really clear idea of what you do and don't want. And the reason that I say that is because it's so important to be able to recognize that moving forward. And I think this really beautiful thing happens where even when a relationship fails, and I don't even like using the word fail, but when it doesn't go to plan or doesn't have the outcome that we want, we still learn some really good things about it. We also learn some things that we (laughs) probably don't want next time. And it just gives us context to use that navigating moving forward. If you haven't, I would recommend you also doing a little journal activity writing out your lists of everything you want in a partner, everything you don't want in a partner so that you can clearly see it when it comes across you the next time. And lastly, my last tip is fully accepting that being hurt is a possibility. And I know it's so hard to accept this and I know it's scary and the thought of it might make you want to be sick, but that is the whole point of being in love and putting your heart on the line. It's taking a risk. It's trusting someone to not hurt you and hoping that they don't. And I know it's scary, but it doesn't matter if you're freshly dating. It doesn't matter if you've been in a relationship for two, three years. It doesn't matter if you've been married for 10. The person you love at any moment could potentially hurt you. And if we are so scared of being hurt that we keep it at arm's length away from us, that's just going to not make our lives very enjoyable, especially if it's something that we really want. But it's just going to mean that we never really get what we truly want and we get hurt in a different way. I obviously don't enjoy being hurt. I don't think anyone enjoys being hurt, but the beauty of being in a relationship and feeling something so deeply is because you feel something so good so deeply. And I always think if I've been hurt really deeply or if I'm feeling pain really deeply, then obviously I love really deeply. And how can I know something bad without knowing something good? So that polarity is there. And I think accepting it does give you that grace to move forward with it. I also know it's easier said than done, (laughs) trust me, but it is important that you don't lose hope. And 
I think if you just hang on to that and just know that you will be okay, you you will be able to navigate it and move forward when you are ready. But overall, don't move forward if you're not feeling ready. Just know within your heart that whenever you are ready to get back out there, the dating pool will still be waiting for you. It's not going anywhere and it will be fine whenever you do get back out there. Good luck and don't rush and don't force yourself if you're not ready to. Okay, question number three. I'm moving to a new city and I'm scared of not making friends and I'm also scared about losing friends from my old city. Do you have any advice? And how exciting to this listener. I think it's super brave of you (laughs) to move. I don't know where you're moving to. I wish you had have told me. Also, guys, if you ever want to give me more context and submit like a few question boxes to give me the information, do that. I can see your name so I can put two and two together. But good luck. I don't know if you also have moved already because I think you submitted this question maybe two weeks ago, but moving can be very overwhelming, very scary. You're putting yourself out of your comfort zone to the extreme. (laughs) I think moving states or cities is a huge shock to the system. And I'm really proud of you for doing it because it takes a lot of courage and takes a lot of strength. It's not for the faint hearted. And I also know that because I have this lived experience. So I lived in Sydney for a few years and I left Melbourne. Melbourne to Sydney is not super far, but you do shake up your whole entire existence to start again, to start fresh in a new location, new environment with new people. And it is a lot to deal with, but I completely resonate and understand your fear because I had the exact same one. I thought that none of my Melbourne friendships would survive. I thought I was never going to make friends in Sydney. And I even went as far as at the start when I first moved to not try and make friends. And I know that's so bad when I think about it. And when I say it out loud, I'm like, what an idiot. But I was scared to make friends in Sydney because I thought, oh, they'll just take up my energy and then I can't give energy to my Melbourne friends. But I very quickly realized that I was not going to survive if I did that because you do need connection, you do need human interaction, you do need friendship, and you do need to build a new network where you are, especially if you don't have any family there as well. And so I'm going to give you a couple of tips and hopefully you can take this away and get onto your journey of creating a new network. The first thing you have to realize is it does take energy and it does take time and it does take effort and I think there's two things that you can do to navigate this. The first thing is to establish some kind of check-in routine with your friends back home. And I don't know what this looks like for you, but some things that worked for me was I used to send like a weekly check-in text to all of my friends back home to say, hey, just thinking of you, miss you, have a great week. Sometimes we would chat in a group chat. Other times we would organize a phone call. Maybe it was like once a fortnight. Find what works for you and for your schedules but do keep that line of communication consistent. I'm not saying you have to text them all day, every day. You just want them to know that you're still thinking of them and still putting effort into that friendship. I do have to warn you though, some friendships may not survive the distance and that is okay. As we are adults, we all have our own different lives and pathways and things like that. And sometimes that energy is not reciprocated. If it isn't, don't panic. All it means is that some of those friendships, the season may have run its course, for whatever reason. And I know it can be really hard to navigate that, but it doesn't have to mean anything bad about the friendship or doesn't have to mean that like you can't hold a friendship or that it's going to be really hard to make new friends. I always think to myself, if someone does want to leave my life for whatever reason, even if it's just because I moved into state, then that just makes space for better and higher value people to come in as well. Then the other element of it is making effort in your new city. And it can be really difficult, but it's not impossible, okay? I know it's possible because I've done it and I know you can do it too. There are possible friends literally everywhere, all right? The top two places I'm going to say is if you obviously work in a company, your co-workers potentially, friends of their friends as well, or if you do something like a hobby like the gym or you play a sport or you do like a class, people that do like-minded things compared to you, well, or with you or that have similar interests to you. That could be a way for you to connect and meet new friends as well. You could also try to make friends with people from your building. You could try to make friends with a housemate. You could try to make friends with people from your local community groups. Maybe it's a local podcast. No, not a local podcast group, but maybe it's a podcast group. It could be people from the dog park 
I have one friend in Sydney who I literally met at the dog park. She had two dashies at the time. I had little Franklin and I used to go to this dog park, I think every like Thursday night after work and we just made friends and it was such a great friendship. And we were just bonded over the fact that like we both had really cute dogs and you could also even do something like getting onto an app. There's Bumble BFF. I personally haven't used it, but I've heard very good things about it. And there's also pages that exist. And obviously do some research, like checking where you live or where you've moved to. But there's one that I found called Conscious Connection. And they do lots of local like meetup style events. And that's a way to connect with like-minded individuals too. You could also come into the Your Safe Space Pod Facebook group and leave a post. I saw one just recently. Someone was moving to a different area and they introduced themselves and said, if anyone's local, please let me know. We can have a coffee. We can catch up for a walk. And I thought it's really sweet. I love those posts. You're more than welcome to do that. The key thing is just putting yourself in these situations. So whether it is you taking that action or you saying yes because someone else invited you, also always say yes. If you get invited anywhere to anything, whether it's like a work function or drinks out, even if you don't drink, still go, use it as an opportunity to start networking. And don't be afraid as well, once you start meeting these people to engage with them and ask to catch up outside of whatever it is you're doing. Again, maybe it's asking for a coffee or a walk or for brunch, or maybe you get invited to something and you want to ask someone to come along with you. When I made friends in Sydney, this is going way back now and I probably sound creepy, but (laughs) I was training at a gym very close to where I was living and I used to train after work and then I started going in the morning and there were two girls in there that had a really cool vibe and I was like, oh, I really want to be friends with them and they're still my friends to this day, Angie and Hannah. They were the first friends I made in Sydney, but they always trained at like 5 (laughs) a.m. and I was like, well, I'm going to start training at 5 a.m. so that like we can start becoming friends and soon enough, we built a friendship in the gym and then that transitioned into a friendship outside of the gym and now they are still very good friends that I have to this day and it's definitely possible, but it did take some effort, obviously on my part and their part to make that work and with time, friendships will grow and that bond will deepen too. It is an effort, but I believe if you are consistent with it and you put in the energy, then you will reap the rewards and you will start to build that network up. Good luck. I'm sending you so much luck. I know it can be really scary, but I promise you this is probably going to be the best thing that you ever do. You've put yourself out of your comfort zone and you're going to meet so many amazing new people as well. As I said, come into the Facebook group, leave us a post. We'll all get around you as well. And then our last question, and it's a bit of a juicy one. How many times a week is a healthy amount for a couple to do the dirty? And I've had this question in the AMA for a long time. I wanted to not avoid it, but I was scared to answer it because I don't want to come on here and say this is the normal amount. I don't think that's healthy. And I think the amount of sex that you have, whether you're single or in a couple or that frequency depends on so much and it's not right for me just to come on here and say, oh, it's this, so you should do that. And I truly don't think that there is like a certain number. I'm also obviously very single. I have not had that much sex in the last two-ish years of my life and Every time I think back to past relationships, it was so different in every single one. What is normal for me might not be normal for you, might not be normal for the next person or the next person. I also am not going to give you researched averages for this. And that's because I don't want to make you feel bad about your own dynamic. There truly is no set amount of sex that a couple should have. And that's because your sex life belongs to you and your partner. And the other thing to note is that it's going to fluctuate. It's going to change. Your libido is going to be so different to mine, to the next person, to even your partners. You also need to look at everything else (laughs) that's going on outside of the relationship too. How is your health at the moment? Are you feeling really stressed? Is your partner feeling stressed? Is there other things going on? Are you stressed about work, kids? Your sex life is going to look different when you're newly together compared to when you just have kids, compared to when you turn 60. There are so many personal factors impacting this. And I think if you are happy in your relationship and the amount of sex you're having is working, then who cares? Fuck the averages, right? I also had 
a event last week that I wanted to touch on because it was an event about sex, hormones, periods, things like that. And at the event, there was a sexologist there. Her name is Chantelle Otten. Some of you may know her. And she actually spoke about this because someone asked this question and she said the same thing. She's like, it depends. It depends on so many other factors. I can't sit here and give you a number because I don't know about all the other variables. And so what I will say is if you are feeling dissatisfied or you're not happy with your sex life or your needs aren't being met, then you could definitely consider talking to a couples therapist or even a sex therapist. Chantal, who I met last week at the event, has her own podcast. It's called Sex Therapy. And there are actually quite a few episodes on there that I think could be really helpful that you could check out, even giving her a follow. Her account is full of great content related to that. And I think it's just like another reminder to like not compare, right? Because what works for you isn't going to work for the next couple and is not going to work for the next couple or even for me in my next relationship. I'm also really happy if somebody wants to do this to start a poll in the Your Safe Space Facebook group to figure out the averages in the safety of that group. If people want to participate, you can do that. But yeah, I just thought I'm going to pop this in because I think it's a nice little reminder to run your own race, to focus on your own dynamic. If you're happy, Who cares what other people do? Who cares what the internet says? And if you're not happy, maybe that's a sign that things need some work. But good luck to you. I think we can wrap the show there. If you are not already, you know the drill. Follow us on Instagram, your safe space pod. Give us a review on Apple or a review on Spotify or a rating, whatever it is. That would help me quite a bit. If you like this episode, please tell someone that you liked it. Word of mouth goes a long way. Share it on your story. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys on Sunday for the next show. Bye. Bye.